So welcome today, Friday the 13th. I couldn't help myself from making this terrible slide. Um, they were warned, they were doomed, and on Friday the 13th, nothing will save them from bad systematic review methodology. Friday the 13th. So happy Friday the 13th today. Um, so today is week four. We'll be looking at systematized literature searching and Prisma documentation today. So it's sort of the next steps down the line in our series. So um, we've been through weeks one through three. And today we are on, as I said, systematized literature searching and Prisma documentation. And then um, next week, we will be taking a break from this series um, for the Deep Blue presentation. So again, um, and Liz, if you're able to pop that link in to register for the Deep Blue presentation, um, when you get a chance, that would be great. Um, it's gonna be a really great presentation from the Deep Blue uh, team in Ann Arbor. They're the ones who run the repository where you can um, you know, upload your scholarly work, different kinds of, um, documents or um, formats of, of scholarly work, also data sets, those sorts of things. So they'll be talking all about that next week. And then the week after on October 27th, we will be finalizing this session, um, bringing all together quality assessment, evaluation, there's tons, tons of parts to that um, presentation, um, but we'll get through the entire process hopefully, and then you'll be more familiar. So the agenda today, is pretty packed. Um, we're gonna look at methods section of the protocol again, just kind of familiarize ourselves with that. Talking about inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, we'll look at the Prisma 2020 checklist. We'll look at database identification, Sentinel articles, which we mentioned last week a little bit, keywords and headings. I'll do a PubMed search demonstration. And then just talk a little bit about the search string generation and Prisma flow charts. So this is probably all um, going to be Greek to you at this point in time with all these words I'm using on here, but we'll get into it and you'll see what it's all about. So last week we talked about the Prisma P, which is um, the uh, preferred reporting um, for these different processes. They have a, a protocol checklist so that you can write your protocol. And um, that talks about the pieces before you even get started. So let's look at those real quick. Um, so this is a table that talks about those different sections that we are gonna be um, looking at today specifically related to searching. So these are the sections you should kind of have nailed down um, before you even start with your protocol. And um, we kind of looked at that last week at the different descriptions for these. So let you take a look for just a second. So the eligibility criteria we'll look at, um, and then the information sources, where you're gonna find these things, um, how you're gonna search for them. That's all needs to be planned out before. So I wanna to talk today a little bit about inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, I didn't really get into that last week. So one of the essential pieces and one of the you know, great parts of a systematic review is that you predetermine the criteria you're gonna use for any articles that you wanna have included in your final process in, or in your final review. And so determining what those criteria are ahead of time, um, it'll kind of let you see for the inclusion piece of it, like where the boundaries are, where the final articles you want to have all the same characteristics in order to be able to compare them, right? You don't want things from kind of all over the place. You want them to be similar in ways so that you can um, synthesize your findings. And then also figuring out what characteristics would automatically exclude articles. Those should also be articulated in the process and will help you to kind of decide you know, which, um, which things you want to include and which articles you won't. Um, so, a little bit more about this. So inclusion criteria is generally more straightforward. You're gonna be looking at your PICO question and you're gonna be kind of breaking it up into the topics and the areas that you're interested in sort of um, categorizing what you want to include. And then the exclusion criteria, that can be a little bit more difficult just because with these projects, you want to err on the side of um, bringing in potentially relevant items and then evaluating them yourself by looking through abstracts, titles, that sort of thing. So you have to be really careful about exclusion criteria and you have to be able to explain um, why you excluded certain things at the outset um, instead of evaluating them later on down the line and eliminating them after you have examined them. So in the final review within your methods section, you are going to have to explicitly state, um, I use the word explicit a lot, these things are very explicit. You have to write out um, what you included, what you excluded, and you must state, as I said, why you excluded certain things. So an example is if you decide that you want to eliminate all articles that are non-English right from the start, you have to say so. So you can say something like, we did not have financial resources to hire a translator. So these are some areas um, that are common for inclusion exclusion criteria as you're generating those. So dates, 
So unless this is an update to an existing review, for most systematic reviews, you don't want to um, exclude by date because there could be relevant information that can inform, you know, across the dates um, of publication. Exposure of interest, obviously, you're going to want to see probably um, only participants or uh, study um, studies that show people that had a certain condition or received a certain intervention. Geographic location, there are obviously different conditions between various areas, so you may have to require um, a geographical limit. So, you know, uh, people within the United States, people within, um, you know, industrialized countries, those sorts of things. Um, so you're not comparing different, um, different populations that have wildly different living standards. Um, again, language, if you want to only do English or you don't have any, you know, don't have any bilingual team members or resources to pay for translation, um, you may want to exclude non-English language results. And then you may be interested in participant groups. So infants, children, uh, people over 65, um, you can kind of label that or ex include slash exclude based on those. Peer review. Um, generally speaking, you're going to want to include gray literature, which is literature that wasn't published in scholarly um, sources. But if you're doing an abbreviated review format, let's say you're doing a rapid review, um, to speed things up, you may want to eliminate um, any gray literature and just do peer-reviewed articles. Reported outcomes. If the outcomes are self-reported, um, you may decide, this is just an example, they may decide to exclude um, any studies that show self-reported articles and try to only use articles that have outcomes measured with you know, objective instruments. Setting um, where the participants were, so did they receive treatment or an intervention in a hospital? Um, were they in a public school, a private school? Those sorts of settings. And then um, for study design, you may want to limit it to specific study designs. That way you're not comparing you know, a mixed methods review, a qualitative review, a quantitative review that all have different information. Um, filtering it, or not filtering, but but uh, expressing which kind of study designs are desirable um, is another good way to, to get light articles to compare. And then types of uh, publications. So again, um, reviews, you generally will include peer-reviewed articles. You can decide you know, if you want to include editorials, if you want to include um, things like that. But um, generally speaking, with systematic reviews, we only include peer-reviewed articles. So the PRISMA checklist, we looked at PRISMA last week as far as the protocol. But as you're doing a systematic review, um, they have a checklist. So once you've finalized your protocol, done all the things that are part of that checklist, we can now move on to the actual systematic review process and look at the PRISMA checklist to see um, if we are following the required steps and have the required pieces for our final article. So I'm going to click through. This will open. So this is the Prisma 2020 checklist. So this was just updated in 2020. And um, you can see here, it's kind of small. Let me bump it up just a little bit. Get rid of this here. But you can see it has it broken down into the sections that essentially you're going to be writing your um, article, your final article. So title, abstract, introduction, methods. And then we get down into the results section, discussion, other information. So each one of these, just like in the Prisma P checklist, gives you a section, and then it gives you the multiple um, areas underneath that with some information about what each of these sections should contain. If I go back here, I'm going to show you there is the expanded checklist, which is sort of like that um, explanation and elaboration document for Prisma P. It's still the checklist, but what it does, is it gives you um, the section and then it gives you a little bit um, of more context. So consider providing in, you know, additional information in the title. It'll give you little descriptions on the sections and what you could um, consider doing and um, basically just some recommendations for how you can go about creating these different sections. Here you can see. These are the sections we'll be kind of going over today. So be sure to check those out because that is um, really, really useful um, and, and this actually essential if you're going to be doing a systematic review to, to utilize these checklists. 
So this is going to look very similar to that Prisma P list we just looked at. Um, the descriptions are a little bit different and the numbers um, for where they're, they're at in the process are a little bit different, but um, you're still going to be looking at eligibility criteria, um, information sources, and search, search strategy today. So you can see um, you need to specify those inclusion and exclusion criteria that you developed during the protocol. And then what you need to do is you need to figure out which databases, um, registers, websites, where you're going to be getting the information from or where you, know, where you end up getting information from at the end. Um, and then as you're doing the searches or if you're working with a librarian to do the searches, um, you need to specify the date for when each search was each source was searched, what this will allow is then later on, if you run an update on your search, or if somebody else wants to do an update on your search, um, they can not have to reinvent the wheel by going through all those articles that you had already gone through. They can start the search based on that specific date and only look at the things that have been published since that date. And then the search strategy, that's where you're going to want to work with the librarian to get the full search strategies for all the databases because you need to explain and show those. It used to be where they only really wanted one full search strategy included in your article, but more and more uh, journals are moving to the, um, the requirement of you providing full search strategies for all the databases that you've searched. So the next step, as we saw here, um, we did the eligibility criteria earlier, and we can just sort of translate that over from our protocol. But the information sources, this is where we're going to want to look at what databases we want to search. So in a systematic review, obviously, you don't want to search just one or two databases. You are trying to eliminate bias by searching as widely as you can without, you know, putting too much effort into it. So there's kind of a, you know, a line as to where um, you know, if you know that there's some really great sources, put those on your list. But um, in, in general, for health re related reviews, um, and I actually have some other in this part, but for health related reviews, you usually want to have two discipline specific databases. So generally Medline, PubMed, CINAHL, um, Cochrane, PsychInfo, and even ERIC, which is an educational database. So those are you that are here for education. You're very familiar with ERIC. But if you're looking in um, health uh, topics that are, have to do with medical education, you may want to use Eric as well. Uh, Embase is a database that has been proven to bring in more unique content, more unique results um, than some of the other databases. So um, again, Embase is primarily for uh, medical literature, but it's very, very um, recommended that you use Embase as one of your sources. And then choose a broad database. So something that um, covers multiple disciplines at once like Scopus or Web of Science. And then Google Scholar actually is a terrific resource. Um, it brings in gray literature, but it also brings in scholarly literature. And so there's been a lot of um, articles written about how Google Scholar actually can improve the, um, the results you get. So there's an article published in 2017 um, in the British Medical Journal that stated and found through the research that the optimal search engines in systematic reviews, and again, this is for um, medical and health-based um, topics, but they should at least search Embase, Medline, Web of Science, and Google Scholar as a minimum requirement to guarantee adequate and efficient coverage. So this study showed that this combination retrieved over 95% of available articles. So obviously that's a pretty great, um, a pretty great coverage of, of finding articles. Um, they found that most other combinations um, may have been like in the, in the 70s or, or lower percent. So um, using these is really great. Um, and then if you're in a different discipline, feel free to contact me. We can kind of see what else we can search, um, you know, for education or social sciences to get um, the best coverage. And I mentioned this last week, but as you were doing um, your sort of sample searches, when you were writing um, the protocol, you want to identify um, what we call sentinel articles. So these are articles that as you were doing your search, you've identified as um, something that you would potentially include and that would make it through the inclusion exclusion criteria to the final stage of review. So having those articles and being able to provide them to the librarian who's helping you with um, the search piece of it, is really going to help to get those search terms, controlled vocabulary, and even locating other appropriate articles um, through their bibliographies and things like that. So those articles can be really, really important um, and really, really helpful as you're going into the literature search stage of your project. 
So then moving on to keywords and headings. So once your research question, once you've final, finalized it and you know exactly what the research question is, you can kind of look at it and start to break it up into the concepts that are related or the important concepts within that question. So here I have an example PICO question. Um, in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee, is hydrotherapy more effective than traditional physiotherapy in relieving pain? So breaking that down into the PICO questions, we can see here that the population I'm looking at is patients um, with osteoarthritis of the knee. The intervention was hy hydrotherapy compared to traditional physical therapy. And what they're looking for is basically pain relief. So here's my sentence again, and I just kind of highlighted what terms in here I think are important and could potentially help my search. Um, the interesting things with, as you kind of get into the searching is sometimes you're not gonna use all of these. Um, often when you're searching the literature, um, articles may not um, explicitly state in the abstract or title what the outcome right was. So you may have to actually go through and filter um, through the articles in order to see if the final outcome um, had to do with pain relief. So you kind of have to do a lot of testing, a lot of iterative back and forth searching to see um, if these terms are necessary, if they're not necessary in your search. Um, so that's why it's really good to include a librarian. And I'll probably say that three more times before the end of this. Um, we are skilled in, in doing that. So I'm gonna talk about the difference between headings and keywords. Um, and we'll get into PubMed and I'll um, show you in action what these, the difference between these two are, but headings is um, headings are basically the controlled vocabulary of the different databases that you're using. So when you do your search string at the end, you're going to have both headings and you're going to use the keywords that you've been thinking of, and they're both going to help in different ways. So the controlled vocabularies are basically, you may have been in a database and seen like thesaurus, or you may have seen something called headings, but as these articles are published, and they come into the databases, uh, human catalogers, at least so far, this may become uh, mechanized by AI at some point in time, but it's generally human catalogers, assign terms to these articles from like basically a hierarchical tree of terms to each article for each concept that they identify within that article. So I think this will make a lot more sense once we get into um, PubMed. But in Medline and PubMed, these headings are called medical subject headings or MESH. So you may have seen that term MESH before. In CINAHL, which is another health database that we have, they're called CINAHL headings. And um, I don't think I have this, I sort of have this in a different slide, but uh, just to draw your attention to it, headings aren't uniform across the different databases. So um, one example that I came across a while back, they've since changed this, but um, about five, six years ago, if I searched for topics related to LGBT um, population, it was listed in PubMed as LGBT. But if I looked in CINAHL headings, it was listed as GLBT. So that was an older sort of acronym and they hadn't updated. They've since updated it. But that kind of shows you that each database can have different headings. So it's important, again, to have a librarian to help to translate these into the different headings and the different sections that you're going to see um, when you see the results of these articles. So the keywords, um, those are the synonyms for the headings that you found, and it's the basically the words that you found in, you know, in your or in your research question, and synonyms for those questions. And um, you still have to make sure that you add in the relevant keywords, but you have to be careful that you don't add in too many keywords that aren't as um, relevant or as um, sensitive to get to, to get results because. You could add in something that will um, unnecessarily bring in, you know, a ton of articles that aren't relevant to your topic. So um, it's important to kind of get these, uh, you know, tested to see if they are um, appropriate. Um, and these can be altered, these keywords and these um, headings, these can be altered during the protocol stage. But once um, you finalize that and you have the terms and the search strategy, um, that is going to be um, the final search that you're going to run for citation retrieval. So the team will agree on that before um, the articles are located. And that's an important part of the protocol and of the initial stage of the project. So why keywords are different from headings? Headings sort of help you to tap into that body of articles that the catalogers felt um, were all related to a certain topic. 
But sometimes um, there may be articles where, you know, again, these are humans doing the cataloging. They didn't um, include that particular heading that you're searching for. But those words are mentioned within the article and you want to kind of bring those in. Um, it's generally, as I say here, more efficient to search in the title abstract field because sometimes there are words that are mentioned like, you know, way down the line, once in an article, and so it'll bring in articles that really aren't relevant, where you can pretty much assume if an author um, is using a word in the title abstract, it's probably going to be a major theme for that article. So it's really good um, to kind of limit to that because it'll help get rid of potentially thousands of articles where a term is only mentioned once. Um, keywords are also a way to bring in articles that haven't been indexed yet. So there is a backlog um, when, when articles come into something like PubMed or CINAHL um, that they haven't been cataloged yet, in which case those mesh terms haven't been assigned. So even though, you know, potentially eventually those headings will be assigned, they wouldn't come up in your searches if you're only searching for the mesh headings. And then I just wanted to give a note about database filters. So filters seem like a really great uh, thing to use, and they can be really great when you're doing other kinds of research, but putting filters in um, when you're using the databases, it can run the risk of eliminating results that otherwise may have come in and you'd find appropriate information in there. And different databases also have different, um, I guess, scopes or different ways that they uh, explain their filters or, or what is filtered in or out. And you want the searches to be um, as uniform as possible across the databases so that your search, you know, is eliminating bias in that way. And so the best practice really is to make the, the, the search that you do broad by not using those filters and then eliminating articles at, that, at the screening stage. So, for example, um, I could put in a, um, an English filter for languages, um, but you may see that an article would come in that is, let's say it's an um, uh, Spanish or Portuguese, um, and the abstract is in English, and you see that that abstract actually looks really, really great, you may want to go through the process of having somebody translate that for you. So if you clicked an English filter at the beginning, you may sort of end up kicking out things before you really realize that they would be really good for your project. So I'm gonna jump out now and I'm gonna kind of show you how some of this works in action here. Um, so I have two links on here. Um, I'm gonna be going straight to PubMed. We can get to this mesh database from PubMed and I'll show you how to do that. Bump up my screen a little bit because it's kind of small. Okay, so um, here we are. And actually I'm gonna make a quick plug for something called LibKey Nomad. Um, let me do this real quick. LibKey Nomad is a browser extension that you can add to your browser, whatever browser you're using. And what it does, as you can see, if you go to Libkey Nomad, I'll put this link into the chat for you. But um, you can put this into your browser. And what it does then is as you're browsing across the open web, or if you're in PubMed, you will see um, this little circle in the bottom. And what it means is that this is connected to my library access. So even if I'm you know, out in the open web, I can find articles full text without having to go back to the library website. So it can be kind of convenient and it's got some nice PubMed integrations, which I'll show you in a minute. But back to what we're doing here, um, I am going to show you, this is you know, the, the main search screen for PubMed. Um, and so since I already have my question and I know kind of the terms and I'm gonna do a very simplified version of this today, obviously I'm not gonna kind of get into the, the full weeds. But I'm going to go down to this little database here, this mesh database, and it's linked here under this explore. So if I click this, it takes me to this screen. So what this is, is this is basically the um, database that contains all of those mesh terms that I was looking for. So the first thing I'm going to look for, I'm just going to look for hydrotherapy first. And I'm not even sure if there is a heading for this, so we're going to see if there's a heading for hydrotherapy. And when I click, um, it should auto match if if there is a heading in there. Sometimes it'll give you related headings. Sometimes it's kind of you know fussy about what it'll do. But um, I'll show you another way to kind of get these terms in a moment. But it brings us to the term. So this term hydrotherapy is one that is assigned to articles that come in um, through PubMed, and it 
it has a little description here. So hydrotherapy is external application of water for therapeutic purposes, such as whirlpool baths or water shiatsu. So this is a better description when we get into Sinol, um, which I'm not actually going to show today, but if you get into Sinol, their scopes and their descriptions aren't as good. Um, but I want to show you then what this page does. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but under here, under this entry terms, this shows all of the different terms that as the catalogers come across these in articles, if an article talks about watsu therapy or water shiatsu or whirlpool baths, they will assign this hydrotherapy heading. So that means when you look up articles with this mesh heading, you're going to get any article that's about any of these topics that the catalogers have identified. So that's pretty useful. And then you can also use these entry terms as potential keywords um, also to look for things. Um, and this can be a great way of finding some new keywords that you maybe hadn't thought of. Under that, this is where you can see that hierarchical tree of terms. And this is really useful as far as, you know, if your search, if you're finding your search is too narrow or too broad, you can come in here and look to see where that term is. And if there are um, broader terms or more narrow terms that are more appropriate for your topic. So if I wanted to do, let's say I wanted to look at aquatic therapy instead, I could click on that. And it would tell me that this is about physical therapy administered while the body is immersed in an aquatic environment. Well, I wasn't really interested in the whole body. I was interested in um, just for the knee. So I'm going to go back to hydrotherapy. And then you can also see that that's listed under physical therapy modalities. So, you know, if we were interested in maybe going broader, physical therapy modalities includes, you can see here, a lot of different things. So that would obviously bring in a lot of extra articles that aren't related to my search. So again, I'm going to go back to hydrotherapy. Um, so if I come back up here, I'm just going to uh, describe this really briefly here. These little boxes here are called subheadings. And these can be useful when you're dealing with a very broad topic. Like let's say you're looking for, you know, heart attacks or cardiac ischemia. Um, limiting it a little bit more to something like, um, you know, adverse effects or trends, something like that can help you to kind of narrow in more. But I will say the catalogers who catalog these things generally may not get that specific. So unless you have a huge body of articles, um, I would say, especially for a systematic review, you don't probably want to use these um, willy nilly. You want to make sure that they're absolutely appropriate um, to exclude articles that you're in, interested in. So once you find the term you want, I'm going to add this into search builder here by clicking this button. And then I can take this search over to PubMed. And then you can see here it adds in this term, hydrotherapy with bracketed mesh. That means this is searching for articles that have hydrotherapy as one of the mesh headings that was assigned to it. So then um, generally speaking, what I do um, is I will go back and do my next term that I wanna see. So again, for this one, then I'm going to look up, um, I'm going to start with osteoarthritis. And so you can see here some other um, things came up that matched. I'm going to click on osteoarthritis right now. But again, if I scroll down here, I can see um, joint diseases, arthritis, osteoarthritis. There is a heading for knee osteoarthritis. So I am actually going to click on that one. And then here's the descriptions. So this is, you know, only going to be articles that are about osteoarthritis of the knee. And again, I'm going to add that to my search builder and take that over to PubMed. So now what we can do is we've done two different searches, right, for my topic. And obviously I could break my topic into more, but for the point of today, we'll stick with these two. Um, I can go to advanced now. And what advanced does is it gives you a history of what you've done so far while you are in your session. So once you log out of PubMed, these will go away. Um, you can log in and you can download them and save them, which I highly recommend doing. Um, but just know that, that these only stay during your session. So basically, these are storing my searches that I've done. So I did two mesh searches, hydrotherapy and osteoarthritis, and then the results that I got for those. So now I know that I do want to start adding in keywords because just these two together won't, you know, they won't include anything that hasn't been indexed yet. So I'm going to take this little three dots right here. I'm going to click on that. 
and you can add your query up to this box. So this is how you can start building um, a search that includes other things. So then got that waiting for us here. Then up here, we've got um, an ability to add terms to this query box. So as I said before, you can search all fields that will search anywhere in any of the article, any of the uh, metadata fields, but we, we really wanna focus on the title abstract. Oops, let me go back down here. So like I said, searching a title abstract, most likely if it's an important concept, you're gonna include it in the title abstract, right? So now I can start putting in some of my keywords. So I'm gonna try Whirlpool. And for single terms, you don't have to put them in quotes. I'm just sort of in the habit of that because as you'll see with multi-word um, keywords, you wanna put them in quotes so that the database searches them together. And then with synonyms, obviously you wanna use the word or. So I'll try hot tub or what else I've written on here, water shiatsu. So then what I can do is um, once I've typed in all of my keywords that I wanna look for in that title abstract field, um, the default is and, but if I want to do synonyms, I'm, I want to combine them all with or because um, that's how you search for you know all those concepts together. So I'm gonna click or. So now I've got that mesh combined with my, um, my other search terms. And if we hit search, let's see, we got 21,000. We can go back to that advanced. So we can see by adding those, and obviously there's more words we can we could add into, but it did increase our um, results by about 600 articles. Um, let's do the same thing with the osteoarthritis one. So I'm going to add that with those three dots to the um, to the query box, and then um, I can type in. I'm going to type in knee osteoarthritis instead of not using a comment. Um, make sure I spell it right. And then this is a tip here that PubMed just started doing this and it's actually very exciting for those of us who do, who do these searches, but they do what's called proximity searching. So I'm not sure if the articles are gonna say like osteoarthritis of the knee or um, knee osteoarthritis or knee presenting osteoarthritis, something like that. I can actually search um, what's called proximity searching. So these two words I can search in any order um, with words between them. So let me show you this real quick. I'm going to search in the title abstract field for this term. Oops. Yeah. I'm going to do the search, but then I'm going to come back in. Go back to my advanced. And I am going to bring this into the query. And if I add a colon, a tilde, and then a number. So if I add a two, what this is telling the database is that I wanna look for the words knee and osteoarthritis within two words of each other in either order, which is nice. Um, so osteoarthritis of the knee would come back. Depending on you know your what you think the terms may be, you can expand this out to four words, which obviously will bring in more articles. Um, if you want to have it only within one, but we're going to do two because I think that's the best. Um, so I'm going to search again. And then when we go to advanced, you can see here. Um, we've got the... Um, I'm looking at this now and it's giving me less results. It should have given me more results. Anyway, I, I think I might have typed something in wrong, but conceptually speaking here, we're just going to keep going. So basically, once you have your snippets set up um, and you have um, your, your searches done in each segment, I like to do them each individually. So then you can kind of start combining them together um, in mean meaningful ways. So I'm going to add that whole hydrotherapy snippet that I created. And then I'm going to add um, that other snippet. And once you have one in there, one part of your query, when you go to do uh, another one, it asks you how you want to combine them, right? And so now that I have two separate concepts that I want, I want articles that talk about hydrotherapy and um, osteoarthritis. I'm going to click and, and then I'm going to click search. And so you can see here now, you know, we went from thousands of results to 89 results that talk about hydrotherapy and knee, os knee osteoarthritis. 
So you can see how that just doing that has brought up, you know, articles that are really relevant to kind of what we're, we're looking for, because they're talking about hydrotherapy, knee osteoarthritis, and it has to include both of those concepts. Um, so I'm going to show you real quick while we're in here as well. Um, as you're generating those mesh terms and those keywords, when you look at the articles themselves, you can come down and on the side in PubMed, there's this mesh terms. And so these show the different headings that have been um, assigned to this, right? So here's hydrotherapy, which we looked at. Um, here is knee osteoarthritis. And then you see that slash. That means they used one of those subheading click boxes from the mesh um, the mesh database. But you can see here, and sometimes this one doesn't necessarily have it, but sometimes you can see other headings that may be um, appropriate and you may wanna jot those down and then include those into your search as well. So basically that is a really um, fast demonstration of kind of how um, librarians will go and you know get these search strings together. Um, then there are a lot of testing needs to happen to see, you know, as I'm adding in these keywords, are they adding um, to the search in, in uh, beneficial ways or are they just clogging things up? Um, the librarian will do a lot of testing, um, testing of those search strings. So I am gonna jump back into here. Sure, okay. And there's the links to PubMed in the Mesh database. And even though I showed that in, in PubMed, pretty much any of the databases um, that have controlled vocabularies have that same feature with like a search history where you can combine the strings. Um, so as hopefully- Emily, can, I, can I say yeah. something really quick? I will, we'll note that like the syntax you use is might be different between the databases. So where Emily put in like slashes and tildes, some of them will use things like um, an asterisk or other notation. So just be aware that there, there is a little bit of difference between the databases and how they do kind of do this. It's like, it's crazy what they do, but there is like some syntax difference. Yeah, and that's actually this slide right here is, um, you know, generating a reproducible search string. So any of your search strings that you have that you create for your projects need to be reproducible. So other researchers need to be able to take your link, take your search, and rerun it um, is it's it's difficult to get that. So librarians obviously can do that. And then as Liz just said, translating it into the syntax for the various databases can be very complex because yeah, there's tildes, there's um, colons, there's quotes, there's all sorts of different things. Not all of them do what's called truncation, um, you know, which is like having a wild card for the end of a word. So that's something that we can absolutely help you with. And then I wanna show um, a sample search strategy here from an article. <laughs> okay, so here is a sample search strategy um, that was published in a Cochrane, um, Cochrane article. So this is the, uh, the search strategy of how this author was looking. This is a cryotherapy article, but um, you can see they're typing in, you know, word by word by word, com uh, combining things together. And this one uses numbers. Sometimes they just use the terms. Um, Sinal uses uh, truncation here. So you can see, I mean, just by looking at this, this probably looks like Greek. Um, so that translation piece is really, really important. And as you can see here, they showed the search strategy for every single database that they searched, which is um, basically it's required now, so. And then um, the Prisma flowchart. So you may have seen these in the articles that you have um, you know, found through databases and read yourselves. Um, they require you to have a flow diagram. And so at each process or at each stage in the process, show you, um, um, this actually took us out to Prisma, but there's uh, multiple options. Um, so the bottom two are if you are doing an updated systematic review. If you're doing a new systematic review, you'll wanna use one of the top two. Um, the top one is when you're searching databases and registers only. The bottom one here, bottom for these two, um, includes other sources. So that's things like gray literature or if you're hand searching. So I'm gonna open that one. And unfortunately it opens in Word, which um, can you still see my screen or was I only sharing my browser? You're good. Okay, awesome. So this is what um, the, the Word flow check the Microsoft Word flowchart looks like. So essentially when you're doing your searching, you start by getting your um, your records from 
what number of databases you searched, what number of registers you searched. And then um, if you remove, well, you will remove duplicate, you know, you, you record those um, if you use automation tools. And then once you get to the screening point, this is where you're searching um, title abstract, which we'll get into all that sort of next week. But you kind of have to keep track of each number of articles that you have and that are making it through each stage in the process. So this is where you've done the title abstract screening. You'll exclude records. And then you will ask for um, actual full text articles. And then you'll, um, if you didn't get them, let's say you tried an ILL, you weren't able to get them for some reason, you would say you couldn't get those. Um, and then finally, the full text um, eligibility, you'll read through um, the articles that you have made it through that. And then you have to explicitly state why you excluded um, the articles at that stage. And then finally, you have your articles for review. And then you have this other um, section here for articles that were identified through you know, websites, organizations, um, through citation searching. So this is something you will have to have completed and you will attach it to your um, supplemental materials when you submit your, uh, your article for publication. So that was a whirlwind, like I said, whirlwind presentation on searching literature in Prisma. Um, next week we have, or not next week, sorry, the 27th, we have even more to go. We have three, four, five, six, and seven. The rest of the process is essentially we will talk about. And that is the end of the presentation for today. So if there are any questions, we can take those now. And I'll put my info on the screen here. Thank you for watching this recorded webinar. Find upcoming webinars to register for at libcal.umflint.edu.